Welcome to season four, episode four of The Open Educator. The best place to be on a Tuesday morning. Thank you for joining us today and for taking the first step to grow personally and professionally. We'd like to encourage anyone who has a camera to turn it on and listen with intention. The USF Entrepreneurship and Innovation Program is unique compared to all programs at USF. Yes, we help develop students to be entrepreneurs and to create their own business. And this is one perspective of entrepreneurship. We also empower students to be innovators within firms, to work for companies that develop new products, services, and business models. And we have more than 15 to 20 students working at companies you may know. Meta, Instagram, Google, Apple, Facebook, you, you name it. And lastly, we help empower students to define careers they define themselves, not what others define for them. They are creating new models of entrepreneurship and innovation that we don't have language for or titles for or ways to describe it. They are inventing their careers, they're inventing their jobs, and they're inventing and meeting their desires and dreams. Our next guest is someone who do, who's doing just that, a very much lived in the moment entrepreneurial journey. Her experience is heartfelt, reflective, and pushes us to consider our own journey and our own place in the world. Her experience you'll see is rooted and what it means to be human and mirrors much of what we don't overly talk about in entrepreneurial education. This very emotional aspect and human aspect of what it means to be an entrepreneur or to start your own venture. We are honored to have her on the cast today. Our next guest will be sharing her journey and experiences of transitioning from a living corporate life experience to starting her own business. Please give a warm welcome to Cam Reeds. Cam, thank you for joining us. We do this in sign language, which is applause if we have our mics on. Where does this cast find you and can you bring us up to speed? Yeah, so this morning you guys can find me at Starbucks at a very busy location because that's one of the perks of starting your own venture and being small. It's your mobile, but you don't necessarily have all the perks that come with the big businesses, the office. So it's a lot of moving on your feet. Right now you guys can find me. I'm in St. Pete. I live in St. Pete, work in St. Pete, play in St. Pete. But you can also find me online. So I am at www dot the spiritual gardener dot com you can also find me on instagram at the spiritual gardener dot com and if you are local in the area you can find me at just about any skating rink any night of the week wonderful i want to ask you that question later on what's the connection of skating or roller skating and entrepreneurship but first tell us about what you were doing before the spiritual gardener? Sure. So the spiritual gardener was really born out of just this journey of rebirthing and reinventing myself, you know? So prior to the spiritual gardener, I feel like I was most Americans. I was every American child that went to public school. I went to school. I got great, great grades. I was a straight A student, maybe one B. Um, didn't really know what I wanted to do, but like my parents, they said, you're going to go to college, okay? They did the Will Smith finger at me and everything. So I went, um, and I went to a two-year school for four years. I took the scenic route because I couldn't figure out what I wanted to do. Um, I knew that I had the gift of gab because every report card I'd ever had since the age of six said, talkative, great learner, supportive in class, disruptive and talkative. So I knew that I could talk to people, and so that led me into a career in sales, so sales and customer service. And at the time, in my late teens, early 20s, perfect. I love to talk to people. I love to be out. I love 
hearing stories, hearing learning. Um, and so I worked for a very large Fortune 13 tech company, worked my way up from sales associate to assistant manager, dibbled and dabbled um, with learning how the recruiting aspect of it worked with coaching and developing, helping other uh, sales reps who wanted to be assistant managers, getting them ready. And then from there, prepared myself and took on the role as general manager. And that's where I was before Spiritual Gardener. So I had a team of sales professionals that I was able to help coach and develop and build their careers with this company to help them get to where it is that they want it to be. And I was getting paid handsomely to do it. You know, it, was, it required a lot of time and a lot of effort. And it was absolutely soul sucking. I hated it. I hated everything about it because I'd outgrown it. And, you know, when I first got into it, I was excited about the technology, but life and just some of those life changes, becoming a different person, evolving, it was no longer a good fit. But I didn't know how to quit because, like I said, they paid me handsomely to be there. They took all of my time. It was taking its toll on my health, mentally, physically, emotionally. Life doesn't stop just because you have a career that's lucrative. Life doesn't stop just because you want to be an entrepreneur. So life and big transitions and shifts were also happening in the background that were causing the pain of no longer being good fit to be amplified. And so part of life happening was me meeting my soulmate or my partner, right, on that spiritual path and us connecting and getting married and having a baby. And so needing more of my time back, realizing that, oh, my goodness, you know, this job that was a great fit for me when it was just me is now taking too much time away from other things that I value, other people that I value. And so one of the things that I started with was, okay, how do I put first things first and get my life in an order that feels comfortable for me? So that's where I started uh, my journey. And that's where I was prior to Spiritual Gardener. I was helping other people um, in a role that did not fit me. So the coaching fit me, but what I was coaching on, not I, said the spy. That's a wonderful grounding of, of where we'll be going. One thing that I want to highlight and connect the theory and practice, while we talk about entrepreneurship and starting a business and being an innovator working for a company, what you have highlighted is that these are not mutually exclusive in the sense of you may find your my students or the audience may find themselves working in the corporate world. But what I'm hearing is this also helped prepare you to some extent of coaching, of managing people, of learning the groundwork, and now it being an incubator to a certain extent of learning prior to launching your own business or moving in to be an entrepreneur. And there seems to be reinforcing supportive, um, we'll say aspects, and they're not mutually exclusive is what I wanna highlight. But I wanna ask you about your mindset at this time, you, 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 you say that you needed to assess, you know, your priorities. What were the conflicts that you were dealing with? And this is always an innovator's dilemma or maybe an entrepreneur's dilemma where you're getting paid well, you have a, a life certainly, and how do you transition away from some of the conveniences that you have working for the corporate life? Can you walk us through about some of the conflict that you might have had or the struggles and and how you went through that yes yeah, so i think i don't think that the struggle to entrepreneurship is unique to entrepreneurship i think that the same exact thing that holds us back from entrepreneurship is the same thing that holds us back in any area of life it's fear it's fear of the unknown it's fear of stepping out it's fear of doing something different and it's confronting that fear and that fear is going to be different for everyone and it's going to be based uniquely on your life circumstances. I believe that everything in life happens for us and not to us. So every single thing that happened into my life up until that point has absolutely prepared me for who I am today, including birthing the mindset that would birth me to becoming an entrepreneur. So you asked me, um, I'm sorry, repeat your question one more time. Just the last part of it. Uh, what were some of the conflicts that, that you were facing? Uh, yeah. working for the corporation, and then venturing into that unknown? So what the conflicts were is I was changing, and I was evolving. Part of me 
going into that route was, again, letting people define for me who it was that I should be. So because people said, hey, you have the gift of gab, you should do this, you would be good at this. I said, okay, I guess I'll do this. So it was a lot of letting other people dictate my path. Even in the position I was in, I didn't want it. When I applied, after I applied, I was like, I really don't want this. And I thought about withdrawing from the application. And I talked to my leader at the time. And I was like, I don't think I want to be a general manager. That seems like a lot of responsibility. I've got some other things in my life right now that I prefer to focus on. And it was one of those, well, are you crazy? Like, don't withdraw. Like, this is the position that other people want. And so I said, well, you know what? This is only my second interview. Nobody gets it the first or second time. Everyone I've talked to has had to apply for this at least six times. This is my first time. So I'll just go through it for the experience. And don't you know I got the job? And so I think that was the first conflict, right? Of, okay, so do you actually want this job or don't you? And I'm someone, at the time, I wasn't ready to step away. And so I said, you know what? There's something in here for me to learn. And so I'll go forward with it. And so I went into this position, one, feeling like an imposter, because I was listening to everybody else that wanted this position too, telling me I didn't deserve it. It was also piggybacking off of fears that I had developed in childhood of not being good enough, of not being worthy due to some trauma in my past. But I didn't recognize that at the time. So I went forward into this experience and I was good at it. When you look at the papers, my team was one of the first doors to achieve our goals. Um, we finished the year highest percentage. We were the store most improved, first to this, most profitable, highest percent to quota. But I wasn't the type of leader I wanted to be. My people hated working for me. I was so by the book and so rigid, I forgot about the human aspect of it. All right. And so I'm going through this again, still not having yet processed anything from my past not even realizing that I'm super closed off and that this is holding me back from being able to connect with the people the way I want to connect with them. And so I'm watching as I'm getting results and I'm watching my team slip away. And I'm in this position, I'm like, this isn't who I am as a leader. How do I change this? How do I stop this? Uh, what do I do? And so I was al I've always been open to how do I do it better? And so I got the team, I apologize. We got feedback working on it. And I'm like, all right, maybe I just need to do this. And the whole time, something in me is saying, this isn't what you want to do. You're not happy here. And I'm like, okay, but I can just be happy. If I just get over this hump, I will be happy here. I'll be good. And there's still, and so we got over that hump. And there was something that's like, but you're still not happy. And I told myself, well, if I could just make this amount of money, then all of the stress, all of this will be worth it. It's just, I'm not getting paid right now what I think that this is worth. And so then I got a great raise. I got a 10% raise and the money was where I wanted it to be. And it still didn't feel worth it. I was literally waking up. There were clumps of hair. Like I was washing my hair one day and I had clumps of hair in my hand from the stress. This was not working. And I was still afraid to quit. And I think that that's so many of us, we find ourselves in careers, relationships, anything else, and it's not working and we feel it but we're so afraid to do something different. I've been doing this for over eight years. What was I gonna do now? I'd built my career. I didn't wanna start over at just some, another company to be entry level and still be stressed and not doing what I wanna do and making good money. And so that's why I said, I believe our path always prepares us because I had hired a sales rep and the sales rep, in addition to working there was a marketing major. And so, he, him and his wife had decided they were going to start a YouTube channel just because and, and do it on a niche they love, just as a hobby. And I was just so inspired, like, oh, my God, wow. Like, you're doing this, and it's like, yeah. And I'm watching, and he's like, yeah, you know, we just got a free, offered a free trip, and we're doing something we love. And I was like, well, I would love to speak for a living. I would love to share my experiences. Still didn't quit because I told you I had a baby and family responsibilities, right? I had another sales rep. I'm talking to her. She was once a general manager for a different company who had her own business and had wrote and written children's books, two children's books, and was an author and had like this amazing, incredible story and was doing nonprofit work and had three kids. I'm like, wow, how are you doing it? And priorities is what they kept coming back to, knowing what's important, knowing what's valuable, knowing it's possible. And so I started the work of just listening to other people, motivational speakers listening to the message that, okay, it's possible. Changing the belief that I could never do this. So, okay, what if it's possible? Okay, it is possible. 
And so I would love to tell you that from the time I had the initial thought of quitting to quitting, it was like a small time, but it wasn't. It took me a year, a year and a half to actually make the decision to quit. I had typed my resignation letter three times before I hit send. And even once I hit send, I gave them a three week notice because I was so terrified of not having money. And I, th I thought about taking it back. I talked to my leader like, well, what if I, what, you know, what if I'm thinking maybe I should stay? Like, what if I'm taking it back? But the morning of, there was just this excitement. I was up early. It felt like, yes, the end of an era. I don't need this. Come what may. I had been listening to motivational videos. I had started running, which I hate to run. Okay. Like, hate to run. But it was the mental training that I was looking forward to. Of, Listen, this is hard, but we can do hard things. Okay. We're going to get to that second crack. And then celebrate, like, look at you, you got to the second crack, okay? Look at everybody in these windows watching you get around this apartment building. Okay, we're running slow, but we're running. And nobody else is out here, and we're laughing. Everybody else staying still. And we've already done hard things in our life. This is the easy part. We've done the three laps. Baby, we're in the last one, and it's right there. We don't stop when it's right there. And so it was cultivating that mindset of, I'm right there. Everything you want is on the other side of fear. And so my fear was if I quit, that I would be broke and homeless and penniless. And I was terrified of that, that I would have terrible credit and nowhere to go because I don't have a family home to go back to. So I was like, it's just me. I've worked so hard. It's just me. And if I fail, there's so much riding on it. It's not just me that's homeless. It's my baby that's homeless. I don't want to be homeless with the baby. And so I kept doing the work on my mind and I was listening to other people's stories like Steve Harvey, who was homeless for two years before his big break. Like uh, um, the gentleman from Pursuit of Happiness, whose name I can't think of right now, who was homeless with his son before getting his big break. And I made it up in my mind that, okay, if my fear is being broken homeless, and that's the bottom for me, am I willing to face that and face broken homelessness for two years, three years, to guarantee that the rest of my life is set up? to guarantee that my sons never have to face this decision, that mommy's got enough money to take care of everything. Am I willing to trust that if I truly believe that if it's possible and that if I do the work that it will come, then I have to be willing to step out on faith. And so I mustered my courage and in November, 2019, I stepped out on faith. Fascinating, fascinating. I want to unpack, cause you talked about this these micro steps that I'm interpreting, this deep down reflection, this mental courage, cognitive courage. But I also know that you took many of these micro steps or other tools that helped you move in that direction. Can you break those down uh, on what maybe what tools you use to help you build that mindset to build these affirmations and or uh, uh, scaffolding to help bridge this this connection from where you were to where you needed to go or what you wanted to build. What tools were you using and how could we adopt those? So I wanna share, I guess, a personal story with you guys here. Um, so one of the things that at, in the beginning of my entrepreneurship and when I was going through the leadership, one of the big things that I was dealing with, in addition to being a new mom, was finally healing and acknowledging that as a child, I was sexually abused. And that that had had deep implications on the career path that I had set out on as an adult, on how I showed up in relationships and how I showed up in my career, on the things that I thought was possible for me. And so that was a big, that was a big thing. So like I said, just being an entrepreneur, just because you have life plans, it doesn't mean that life won't still happen. So a big part of those micro steps for me was getting comfortable again with myself, because I learned from an early age as a kid, I thought that it's me. This is my fault. This is happening. It must be something's wrong with me. And because I didn't get, I never, I hadn't unlearned that until I started to process it and get the help. So a big part for me of those micro steps was understanding how everything had led me to this point of being a manager. It was wanting and knowing that, Hey, there must be something different um, out here. Not everybody hates what they do. Not everybody's stuck in a life that they don't enjoy. So how do I get there? And so a lot of the micro steps for me was, again, looking back at, okay, what led me here and solving that work, but building on it, right? And realizing, all right, I've already, and for me, it was cultivating that mindset. I've already lived through hard things. 
what I lived through was hard. This healing, this is the easy part. This is the part where I get to let go. This is the part where I don't have to work at a job that I hate. This is the part where I get to do things for me. So a lot of my micro work was journaling. It was listening to affirmations, things that built me up, things that built upon this vision of who it was that I wanted to be. I recognized that where I was and the thinking that had brought me to where I was was going to keep me there. And if you want something new, you've got to do something different. So I started asking myself in the universe, well, and, and this is like, I guess what would have kicked off this whole journey is, who am I? Why do I do the things that I do? Who am I? What do I want? And it started with this question of who am I? And that determined, okay, well, I, I like, to, what do I like to do? How do I get in touch with me? So a lot of, like I said, those micro steps were affirmations, listening to things that made me feel good as a person, because I think that we are the center. If you don't feel good and you don't believe in you, it doesn't matter what steps you take. It doesn't matter what guru you listen to. It's not going to work because you don't believe it's possible. So I think for a lot of us, it's working on how do we change the belief in myself that it's possible? What do those steps look like for me? Affirmations, journaling, doing things I love. Um, so it looked like skating, reigniting that kid in me, that creative part. Because I think so much of adulthood and what we think of adulthood is us really just denying our inner child. And the child is the creative part. The child is the part of us that connects us to the spirit world, the part that's unseen, the ideas, the inspiration that come to us. That's the child. And so when you disconnect yourself from that child in you, you disconnect yourself from possibility. So micro steps are getting back in touch with the child, whatever that means to you, doing things that feel good. Because when you feel good, you start noticing, oh, I feel better and you want to do more of it. And you start seeking out things that make you feel better. And the more that you feel better, the more that you build your confidence. And the more confident you are, the more you are willing to take big risks, like quitting the job, like branching out on your own. The more confidence that you build and the more risk you take, the more that you're willing to be bold and to tell people, I do this now. This is who I am. Because everybody's going to have known you for who you used to be. And so it's showing up again. Hey, this is who I am. And building the confidence that you don't feel like an imposter when you say that you're like, no. This is what I've been doing. This is the work I've been doing. This is how I'm sewing it. This is how I'm owning it. And this is where I'm going because of it. Thank you for sharing that. those tools. Yeah, I, because we don't talk about, we have to put in the work for ourselves and whatever that work is. It could be journaling, affirmations. It could be getting exercise, getting those shots of dopamine to put us in that that state that allows us to make that transformation, to make that leap, to walk across that bridge. And we don't talk about that because we just say, oh, we go out and find a problem and, and solve it for people. And that's what entrepreneurs do. But there is this resiliency that needs to happen. And of course, everyone's at different places and you're, you're sharing your experience, which I think translates to others if they find themselves in any relatable situation, which I think is a human experience, as you said. It's not just tied to entrepreneurship, it's tied to the unknown. It means changing jobs, changing careers, changing, moving, whatever the case may be. Wonderful, thank you for sharing that. And these are very practical tools that we can easily say, if we need to wait, you know, build muscle, we weight lift. But if we want to be mentally sound and know who we are and take action that is aligned with us and our values and who we want to be, we also have to use these steps and or exercises, journaling, reflection, hard questions and answers of, of our of self, um, future, past, these types of things that is a form of weightlifting, is a form of, of putting some tension to a different type of muscle. So thank you for sharing that. I know you also go by the spiritual gardener and that's kind of your platform. Can you share a little bit about what is the spiritual gardener and, and uh, how that has taken shape? Yeah, so, you know, what? I have been thinking about this question, like, who is the spiritual gardener? And I told you, so for me, a lot of, a lot of where I'm at right now has always started with the question, who am I? Where do I want to go? What am I here for? Who is the spiritual gardener? So spiritual gardener, I have been doing the work of making videos, sharing my experiences, helping people to like, listen, some of your best gifts are going to come wrapped in sandpaper, okay? And when you go to open them, it's going to tear some skin. It's going to get bloody. It's going to hurt. But the gift in there is still going to be worth it. And I, I kept asking, well, what is my niche? What, do, what is it that I do? What is the problem I'm trying to solve? What do I want people to take away? 
and I realized like I plant seeds, that's it, right? I plant seeds, I water seeds in other people. I plant ideas. I plant ideas about what's possible for you, that you can lean in and trust yourself. You already know that you can do it. If you couldn't, you'd have never had the vision. I don't have visions of me baking lots of cakes in a bakery. It's not for me. So, you know what I mean? So the things that come to us, it's because we can do them. So how do we lean in and trust? How do we bridge that fear? And so, again, asking those questions of who am I getting reflective, which is one of the things in the micro points, um, led me to like, what do I do? And I was like, I plant seeds. I'm like, how do I do it? I was like, spiritual. I was like, it's nothing that the things I'm talking about aren't things that you can go to the store and be like, I need five coupons for self-esteem, positive development, you know, mental stability, mental stamina and perseverance. They're spiritual seeds. They're ideas that you have to take and plant in your heart, right? They're ideas that you say, okay, I do want this. So how, how do I do it? And so I plant the seeds spiritually because I believe, again, everything's created first in the spiritual, then in reality. The thought to you comes to you here. Nobody else can see it, sense it, anything. It comes from the essence, the unknown, right? And then you decide to take action on it. And then we see and we're like, oh my God, that's a beautiful chair. Oh my gosh, this is a perfect coffee. But if people never took action, if they let fear stop them, like I want, I, I think about it all the time, like with my favorite speaker, some of my favorite products that I use, right? What if this person had said, no one's gonna like this. This has absolutely no value. In my message, no one's gonna listen to it. What if they didn't do that, right? What if I never got that message? So that kind of fuels me. So that's where the spiritual gardener comes from. It's tending to the unseen. I think our world leans so heavily on what we can quantify with the practicality. We forget that there's a whole other part of life that works and that moves. And we forget that, hey, kids, they don't know what's going to happen. They just know that if they want a toy, they're just going to talk about it. And, I, I, and I'm blessed in that way. I look at my children. I think that I look at how kids work. They want a toy. They're, I want this toy. And they make room for it in their lives. And I'm going to put it right here by my bed before they even have it. And I'm going to name it this. And I'm going to play with it every day. And I'm going to take care of it. And they're already preparing their mind and their space spiritually, mentally, emotionally for it to take place physically. And I think sometimes as adults, we have it backwards. We're like, I want this, but I don't know how it's going to get it. So we don't start preparing internally for it until we see it externally. I believe that we attract all things to us, right? So my millions are on their way to me. But first, if I want millions externally, if I want richness externally, I have to cultivate a rich inner world. I have to be sold here first because that's the type of things that are that riches are attracted to. They're attracted to that type of person and lifestyle. So that's where the spiritual gardener comes from. It comes from a place of knowing what it's like to be empty, knowing what it's like to have something happen. And I could have used that as an excuse, right? And been like, this happened to me, right? This is why I am the way I am. But I believe that it's my divine responsibility. Okay, but who can I become now? How do I use that to serve me? And so for me, I've used, like I said, some of the sandpaper gifts of, all right, this hurt. It caused me to lose myself. It caused me to go down a path I didn't want to. It's a human experience. That means that there's somebody else out there having the same experience that isn't doing what they want to do, that isn't living in their purpose. And when they don't live in their purpose, it's a disservice to me and to you. Because imagine if I had a stayed working in technology, these words that we're sharing right now, and I see some of you guys like, yeah, like that hit, this is my purpose, right? And so a lot of people have that same purpose and they're so afraid to bring it to light. And when you don't, everybody misses out. So I use my experiences, right, in the sandpaper moments. I use that not knowing to say, hey, you know what? I didn't know, but it's all worked out to here, right? I had a thought that it's possible and that I could, something else has to be possible. And I see that now, right? I had a thought, well, what if I want to speak of my experiences, right? And so now I get to do that. And so now my next step is, well, how do I make this profitable? Because I put time into this. It's been years that I've been sowing, right? So I believe that it's, it's like a seed. If you sow it and you water it and you give it attention, you can't force it. But if you give it the things that it needs, you make sure that you're watering it daily. You're giving it the sunlight. You're playing the creativity. You're letting the air hit it. It has no choice but to grow because that's what our that's what this whole universe is. So the things that I've planted are now growing and blooming. And so that's where the spiritual gardener comes from. It's tending to the small things the same way that we tend to the big things. 
Wonderful. And one reason why I'm happy you shared what you did is because we talk about organizations or our companies or our ventures having missions, having branding, having marketing. And what you're talking about is the aligning the ethos. So for instance, how you see the world is largely reflected in not only your name, but the, the methodology you use, the metaphors you use to help others understand themselves to, to move from point to point. And here we see this strong connection of how this individual entrepreneur, meaning Cam, uh, aligns her business strategy, aligns her branding, aligns her marketing um, to, to be effectively communicating and then the tools that she also uses as a way to uh, help uh, communicate her ideas and, and you know, uh, her services. So fabulous starting point in terms of transitioning out of the corporate job. Uh, where are you today? What's the short, maybe in medium term, and maybe how, what were the next steps after you left the corporate world um, that you were you were going through? And maybe you could share a bit about about that and where you are today. So it's interesting because to be an entrepreneur and a business owner, because I never wanted this. I never wanted to be a business owner. I wanted to be like CEO of somebody else's business. But I never saw myself going down the path of entrepreneurship. So really for me and knowing myself, what it is, is a lot of what I do in my work is grounded in spirituality. I'm a very spiritual person. So my entrepreneurship, again, is born out of the spirituality. As far as what's next, um, the vision is big. So the intermediate steps, like I said, the, the beginning for me was how do I build a foundation, right? So it was play at work. It was, you know what, let's just do it. Let's do it badly until we figure out how to do it better. Let's just let it be ugly because creation, a lot of times, I think we want it nice and neat. And that's why we don't start. We're afraid to be the novice. We're afraid to have it look bad, to just be terrible at it. And, you know, I was talking to one of my friends and she was like, listen, the beginning's always terrible. She's like, you'll look back 20 years from now and your beginning stuff, you'll always think it sucks. She's like, so I say, get to sucking so you can be good already. And so I took that and I ran with it. So the beginning was just, just, just do it. Just, just make the video. Make the video. Don't even watch it back. Cover your eyes and just put it out there. And so that's where I started. I just posted and I didn't even look at it. I couldn't even review it. It was too much, right? And so after three years, and I got as I got more comfortable, and I was like, okay, let's 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 watch this back at least and start editing a little bit, okay? Right? Like let's get some good captions. This music work, and so it's it's built organically. And so now that I have the foundation for okay, this is the type of thing I want to talk about, right? Like, this is the impact I want to have, right? Like, I've been I'm doing a lot of the background work. The business, it's set up from a legal standpoint, it's set up. I have all of these ducks in a row. So it's like, all right, the foundation is there. We've done the work. I've done the interviews. We've spoken at different places. We've entered and won speech competitions. Like, we're leaning on past experience. The next step is, how do we make this profitable? Right. Because I told you a lot of the work in being an entrepreneur is believing that it's possible because literally there's so many days where I wake up now. And as an entrepreneur, you're going to you'll face this like it's not always sunshine and rainbows. And the work I'm talking about doesn't prevent you from having those bad times, doesn't prevent you from having self-doubt, but it helps you to navigate it when it comes. There are still times where I'm like, oh, my God, God, if you want me to quit, just say that. You know what I'm saying? Because at this point, it's been it's been three years. And I've given up my comforting lifestyle. I've given up the luxury apartment. I've gone to more humble beginnings, but I'm sick of being in this place. You know what I mean? So like, then the work comes in of, okay, but I understand that this place is helping me grow. I can bloom where I'm planted, but it's not always sunshine and rainbows in the entrepreneur journey. It's other people telling you sometimes like, why don't you just go work here and do this? And you still being like, listen, I know it looks crazy. I know I look like the meme of the dog right now who's smiling and the house is on fire but it's fine, right? So literally, because that's how it looks and how it feels as an entrepreneur. When everything outside externally is telling you like, you need to quit and go back to work. There's that drive and that someone is telling you, uh-uh, you're right there. So my next goal is now that we've got the foundation, how do we make it profitable? Because we've done the work. I've got three years of free content that people need to see. Well, what are you about, right? And it's, well, great. I'm glad you asked. Let me show you. Let me talk to you about what I'm about, because I'm like some people. And that's why I said, I think uh, for me, and I think what you were saying, where it goes in the future is it's a heart based living. It's not based on fear. of I have to do this. It's based on the thought of I get to do this. I get to wake up 
and do what I love. And so this is cultivating the rich inner world, right? The money's not here yet. It's not in my wallet yet, but it's here in my heart. I get to wake up and speak for a living. I'm speaking to you guys today. This is what I get to do, right? I get to go and skate. I get to the trade off of everything. I get to now that I, I may not be um, at the last time. I get to spend that time with my kids. I get to decide what are my values and how I prioritize my day. I don't get to buy the $200 dress right now, but I get to do all of these other things, right? And become this person that feels good, that embodies feeling good, that loves the life I live because it's based on my values. I get to, my business is based on what I love doing, right? And so attracting everything else to me. So interim goals now, how do I turn this profitable? How do I take the experiences that I've gained? How do I take what I've done in the past? How do I communicate that in a way, in a marketing way? of taking, again, the business savvy. I told you I worked in sales for over 10 years. That skill now, now I get to sell my own services, right? How do I translate that into making this profitable? Because there's more for the spiritual gardening and we have to grow from here. Thank you for sharing that. We talk about in the classroom of getting your content or your product out to the market and getting that feedback in order to iterate, in order to improve, in order to constantly build and help evolve where where your venture goes and i i think it, we can clearly see from your example that's what you're doing and it can be scary and you can have doubts and you can question yourselves uh but this is a, a wonderful example i'd like to prime the audience if they uh questions in q a coming up um and what they may want to share and or ask cam about her experience congratulations cam on your win for the regional uh, competition competition at toastmasters what's that been a lot been like and um how is that feeding into your um project here the your your venture i guess Sure. So Toastmasters, if you don't know, because I thought it was just like, how do you give a great speech, you know, at a wedding? But it's an international organization. Um, it's a nonprofit. And it helps you build your public speaking skills. And so I'm someone, I believe that if you truly have a calling, there's something you want to do. Maybe you can't jump fully into it, but you can do a little bit of it. So for me, one of the first steps was, was like, all right, I want to try and speak for a living. I knew I wanted to do that. Didn't know how or where or who was going to pay me for this. So I said, OK, well, where can I speak? And I found Toast, and I said, all right, I can join here and start practicing speaking, right? This is a public audience, at least the people that don't know me, where I can practice honing some of these skills. And then from there, I found they do international competitions. And I'm like, oh, my God, this is perfect. Like, but if I never had the idea, I wouldn't have known, because international competition, I'm looking to be a world-known speaker. Oh, my gosh, this is, like, right up my alley. So I started practicing, giving speeches at my local club. Letting people know what it is that I wanted to do. I see this message on social media all the time. People are like, keep your goals private. Outside energy throws them off. That's nonsense. Put what you want to do out there. Because if people don't know what you want to do, they don't even know to mention your name or to think of you when these conversations come up. So when I started Toastmasters three years ago, I came in and said, I want to be a public speaker. I want to get paid to speak. I want to be a motivational speaker. And people knew that. So when you see me and when they were giving feedback and I was doing things, they knew what my goal was in mind. Um, and so now here we are three years later, I was in a speech competition last year and uh, made it to, I think, I don't know, I forgot what comes after regional, but like uh, made it, made it, I think like four or five levels in this speech competition. I'm in this one, the international, I'm going to the regional level now, I've made it past like our district level and things. But a lot of that is getting the work out there and again, doing a little bit of it, being able to refine my skills in a safe space and then presenting them publicly. Thank you, and I also was l lucky to to see your speech at uh, w that you gave at at St. Pete College, which was was excellent. I'd like to open the floor for questions. What questions might you have for Cam or comments? Um, so I just kind of want to ask, like, how do you think that um, your experience in your sales job? Do you think that prepared you at all, or gave you any like life experience? Obviously, it gave you life experience and stuff, but anything like that uh would help like your entrepreneurial spirit and like guide you to like start your own business kind of or you know like was it just the fact that you didn't really want to be working for someone um i think 
I think it's a great question. I think everything in our lives is perfectly set up for us to do what we need to do, right? So for me, my sales experience taught me how do I, I have a gift for talking and storytelling, but how do I take that and how do I learn to uncover what's important to you, right? So being in a sales and having a structured sales process is part of that. It's taught me how to have a conversation where it feels natural, how to uncover what's important to you within the first 30 seconds, how to align with what's important to you, how to then present the solution to you, and how to tie it up and ask for that sale, right? Because so many people have that wrong when they go into business for themselves. They know why their product's great, but they don't know how to connect it to their audience. They don't know how to talk to people. And so it comes off pushy versus if I like, oh, Oscar, you like bagels. Oh, dude, that's awesome. Me too. I eat one every morning. What kind do you eat? Have you ever tried it with this? Dude, you should try this brand. Have you ever tried it? No. You like gluten-free? You should try mine. They're gluten-free and they have this. Here, let me give you a sample. Right? So it's, it's learning how to uncover that quickly. The coaching piece of that um, was I realized I do love coaching, right? And so because I was a sales leader, it was perfect. I had sales reps that are all over the place, right? Top performers, low performers. And I think that for me with what I'm doing, I'm going to have people that are all over scale. Some people are going to be full of self-confidence and they just need help overcoming this one difficulty. Some people are going to be like, listen, I don't even want to look at myself in the mirror and they're going to need help building. So it taught me that the skills that I apply and the, like the, the technique I apply to one person who's struggling with one thing may not apply to the other person. You've got to approach people differently, right? And it's all about that person. What is your gap? It's taught me how to watch. So as a manager, part of what I did is I would watch my sales people in action and I would listen to their sales process. So it taught me how to pay attention and identify where the breakdown is. So not just hearing it, but saying, okay, this is where the breakdown is. If there's a lot that's broken, it taught me how to say, okay, listen, this is the big fish. This is the piece we have to solve for first before we can get to see all the other things. So it's taught me how to prioritize. And so even, and that's why I said, like, no matter where it is that you're in in life, while I hated it, it taught me how to prioritize. Um, it taught me, again, how to coach. I went to different seminars that built me up. Like I went to like women empowerment, women of wireless, so many different things that helped me see, okay, this is possible. There were Stephen Covey trainings that I attended on. How do you build influence? So how do, so all of those things that I have now, how to have tough conversations with people in a way that leaves you both feeling win-win. So those are soft skills that now go into the coaching business that I had the privilege of not having to pay for because of where I was at. Um, also, even now, like I said, because I, I do work part-time still, right? Because until my business is fully profitable, sometimes it's okay to do two things. And I think people think entrepreneurship is all or nothing, but there's still value that can be learned in being an employee. Now, being an employee, I get to hear and listen to customers, the things they complain about for my business. What are their pain points? Not from an employee perspective, but just from the general public, right? What are you talking about? What can I listen in on? I pay attention to the words people use, how they view me. And I'll tell you this, there's a big difference I can even see and there's some work to be done. If someone runs into me and I'm at work and it's a woman, they normally say, I'm sorry. And even if they're asking me a question like, hey, I'm sorry to bother you. And I'm like, I work here. It's not a bother. Whereas a men will approach me and be like, hey, do you work here? Yeah, well, where can I find this? So even the apology, so it's noticing those nuances and now knowing, okay, when I'm coaching, how can I apply what I've learned even here? So being a student everywhere. Is, is one of the success for an entrepreneur because information is only good for 18 months, right? So if you're only, if you're not continually learning, if you're not continually watching and no matter what your situation, taking that in to improve yourself, which will ultimately improve your business, that's how you end up stuck and end up in a company that sinks. Awesome. Thank you. What other questions or comments might you have for Cam? Cam, wow. Wow. <laughs> I'm trying to keep it together. Like everything you said, like just <clears throat> resonated with me. I'm trying not to cry. <laughs> because I see a lot of former you in me right now. I was trying to keep it together. <laughs> I was trying to keep it together. Like as I was listening to you. I'm such a cry baby. It's <laughs> but, fine. The question that I wanted to ask was um, 
all these things that you're doing now, like, how do you see yourself in the future, like, day to day? So I know what you, I know ultimately what you want to do. I looked at your website, but like, <clears throat> what do you see? What do you, like, how, how do, how does a day look for you in the future when you're doing what you actually love? So if, it's funny. So if you've ever, there's this Issa Rae. So I love her, first of all. She's my shero. So if you don't know who she is, Google her. Uh, but she had a show called Insecure on HBO. And in season five, I want to say it's like season five, episode eight, you see where she, her character has taken on entrepreneurship, kind of like the same journey and successful. So for me, it's interesting. And like, even coming on here, I was worried about it because I told you so much of our world right now, when we think about who's credible, who's not, is can you A, B, C, can, is it fully practical, the plan? Is it foolproof? And a lot of spirituality is not foolproof in the traditional sense that we're used to seeing it, right? But again, if you do things the way they've always been done, you'll only get as far as you've ever been. I'm a different kind of leader. I'm a different kind of entrepreneur. I'm not the entrepreneur that set out, look, I want to have businesses. I'm the entrepreneur that set out of who am I and how do I show up here? Um, so for me, when I think about my vision, and I've always known this, and I think that part of that is getting who you were. As a kid, I knew that I was going to be famous. Like, people were going to know me. I didn't know why. And I remember telling my mom, I was like, one day people are going to know my name around the world. And I was seven. And she's like, for what? I was like, I have no clue. And I've always had a gift for writing and was winning literary competitions in high school. And so I think that our gift and our circumstances perfectly poise us for who we're going to be. So for the future, and it sounds cocky, right? But I believe that fortune favors the brave. I'm going to be big as Oprah. And I think that Oprah had to embody spiritually who she was before she was ever embodied it in the world. So I'm out for billions with a B. And I say that because I believe you have to set your intention and make it known if you're going to achieve it, right? These aren't big, small goals. I'm a woman. I wear a size 11 shoe. I have big feet and big shoes to fill. I'm here to leave an imprint on this planet. Um, so the day-to-day, -day, what that looks like for me, it looks like centering. So a lot of right now, I'm a go, go, go type of person. So a lot of what my entrepreneur, what my entrepreneurial journey should be teaching me is how to rest. Right. And so I believe that everything in life, I've had two babies that I've birthed and I understand the importance of working with what's going on in the energy and resting and how that helps to, to bring everything to fruition. So a lot of my day to day right now is looking at, okay, I start with centering myself. I'm at the center, right? What's the best action for me to take today, right? I know what my long-term plan is, so what can I do today? And so sometimes it's little things. As an entrepreneur in the beginning, small business owner, you don't have the assistant. You don't have the web designer. So my website, that was me saying, all right, let me research how what website I can make one on. Let me research how much it costs, right, before the business profit. How do I put this money in here? And it's balancing it. Right. OK, so now I got to. All right. How do I get videos on here? So I got to make the videos, the speeches that I give. I have to take time to create the speech and edit it and give the speech. So it's all of these different things that go into it. So for me, the day to day is just looking at. All right. What do I need to do? My checklist, because it'll never be done. And so I'm not the person that tries to get it all done anymore. I'm the OK, what can I get done today? And we'll let it roll. And I understand, too, a part of it, like I said, mine is belief is. What's for me is always for me. It can't miss me. It's waiting for me to get there. So I don't have to rush. It's already been done. I just have to wake up each day and take the steps that day to ultimately bring it closer to me. I hope that answered your question. Yes, thank you. Any other questions or comments? Because I, I have a couple, but I would like to hear from you. Kim, you talked about the importance of learning and staying relevant. You mentioned Toastmasters. What else do you do to continuously learn and stay relevant? I have adopted a childlike mindset. Um, and when I say childlike, it's not like, you know, in the sense of like kids just run around, you know, oblivious. It's like it's, it's marrying, again, that inner child with the adult version, right? And that having that harmony and balance. So I'm someone I can see the extraordinary and the mundane, every single ordinary, everyday thing. And so for me, because I look at life in such a way that I'm always looking for the extraordinary and the mundane, I learn everywhere. 
from anybody of any age. Like I, lo- I have a one year old and feeding him is, is a whole thing, right? Like my adult mind is like, oh my gosh, I'm going to have to bathe this child when I'm done and wash his hair because he's one and they're just, it, it's in the hair, it's everywhere. It's on the floor. But one of the things I like seeing with him and, and that helps me like is um, if he's eating, he can literally have food in his mouth. But if it's time for water or if there's something else he sees, he will spit it out of his mouth, wipe it off his tongue to ready himself. Like, listen, I'm ready. I can take what I can take that now. I'm ready. Look, eh, like won't even finish. And I think that sometimes, you know, in a, as adults, we get stuck into thinking, well, I have to be ready. So let me finish this first. Right. Let me save up the money first. Let me just finish out this year. Let me buy the house first. Let me do this first. And I like I said, so what, one of the things I've learned is sometimes how do I just get ready now? Because I, I, I call it the spirit, universe, God, whatever you want to call it. But it's like sometimes, and so it's learning again, like, okay, God, I'm ready now. I'll let go of everything at a moment's notice. If you tell me that this is no longer the way to go, then I'll stop in my tracks and I'll pivot. Um, so a lot of it has been doing that. Um, on my page, I've had five to six minute motivational videos. I took a break in December because everything in me was telling me I need to rest. Didn't want to. Everything in me was like, but we have goals to get. I got to because I had a workshop in January, a prepare for success workshop that I launched. And I created an entire workbook for it on, ha- on reflective questions that people could get in, in touch with themselves and figure out what's important to them. Um, and so I'm like, we got, we, I've got goals, billions with a B, I can't stop. And uh, everything in me was like, you need to rest, right? And I told you guys, because life doesn't stop. And I had to deal with life for a minute. Um, and I've been wanting to go back. I have videos on my phone where I've been trying to go back and it just hasn't felt authentic. And so finally, I just, you know what, I gave in. I said, all right. I put up a big picture on my Instagram that says, currently filling my cup. You can find me on my personal page where play is at work because I understand the importance of play as well. I can't, you can't pour, 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 give, 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 give. You can't always adult and then wait until later uh, to do the things that matter most. It's a balance here, right? And just like I, you can't always lean to the spiritual, I got to be practical. I can't just be like, I'm spiritual, don't need to eat because bills have to get paid, right? And so it's how do you balance? The question that I like to ask all my guests are, if you could go back to your younger self, what advice would you give her? Oh, my goodness. You know what's funny? So, uh, Adana, you talked about being a crybaby. So I recently came across a picture of myself at, like, I think I was, like, 18 or 19 in the photo, and I just... Picking it up, I just cried looking at it because the girl in that photo, I just remember being in so much pain. And I'm like, but that, and I'm just so thankful for who I was, right? Because that girl sacrifices, that girl carrying the pain allowed this woman to be born. So I'm so grateful to who it was that I used to be, right? And I'm not so, I don't run from shadows. I'm not that love and light person. I'm love and hug my shadows too, because I understand that it was always out of self love no matter how misguided, right? And so um, the advice that I would give my younger self is I would tell her, because I was searching. I was searching for something. And I didn't know that I was searching for myself at that time. I didn't know that I was the answer to the question. And so I would tell myself that you are the key. You're the key to the queendom. Like, go in. You're already enough. And I would tell myself that you're already on the path keep going it gets so much better wonderful uh this has been a fast one hour thank you so much for spending uh this time with us and sharing us with your about your journey uh where you're going any last words of how the students or anyone uh, listening can reach out to and learn more about cam reads yes absolutely so i'm up to big things so like i said i took some break from making the videos front end but there's three years worth if y'all want to go back or if you find yourself needing some motivation to keep going and i've documented that journey including the entrepreneurial process in the transparency because there were some moments when i got up and i'm like y'all today today ain't today okay so all of that is there but going forward i would say Follow me on Instagram, find me on my website, and sign up for my newsletter. I'm not a spammy person. 
okay? I don't like my inbox being filled, so I promise I won't fill yours. But what I will keep you up to date on is speaking engagement. So I had this one today. Um, I've got the a speech competition coming up. So if you want to hear what the spiritual gardener is like with a solidified message, not just sharing experiences, but telling a story that connects to the hearts and minds of each of us, definitely follow so you can see that. Um, I have an event coming up at St. Pete College later on this month that I'll be posting on my Instagram, my LinkedIn, um, also on my website. Um, it's an hour long. This one's going to be for sexual violence awareness. I think it's something where everybody can benefit because it's a different type of conversation. I'm a different kind of coach, a different type of speaker. So I would love for you guys to follow along um, for that journey because things are always shifting and changing. And then because I'm getting more into myself, right, speaking this way, again, everything evolves. So I'm also going to be starting to showcase and share some of my poetry. So something for everybody, you know? So definitely, you can follow Kim, me on LinkedIn and Instagram. This has been a pleasure. Thank you for spending the time with us. And we'll be in touch to hear more and continue following you on, on those channels. So I would like to say, on behalf of the audience, we'll give you a big round of applause through sign language. Mm -hmm. And we'll be in touch. Thanks, Cam. Thanks for having me.